Hi, I'm Christy Shriver, and we're here to discuss books that have changed the world and have changed us. And I'm Gary Shriver, and this is the How to Love Lit podcast. Um, This is our third episode featuring what uh, some people consider to be the great American novel. And after two weeks of uh, symbolism and irony and (laughs) Politics and layers and layers of imagery meaning. I mean, I, I'm starting to see why people are so fascinated with this book. I well, mean, English teachers are. Uh, it's so <laughs> dense, and there are so many ways to read it, and I guess that's what's kind of fun about it. I mean, um, I liked reading it for the story, and I love the movie with Leonardo DiCaprio, uh, although I know there are many hardcore Robert Redford fans out there that you know may take me to task for that. Oh, but, yeah. But as, uh, as I've read it this time, I've really enjoyed reading it for the uh, political commentary. And I love the discussion of the values of Thomas Jefferson and all the distortions um, or really just the perversions of the American dream. Well, it's an idea that we mentioned and the American dream will come back and back. Although I just don't like the term. I'm sorry. It implies that the notion of the possibility of self-improvement on the basis of hard work and personal sacrifice and genuine merit is an American thing, which it's not. That's a worldwide good person thing. (laughs) Well, what have I been saying about the American dream? I know it's just something. It's a myth, I guess. Well, it's it's a it's a construct that really critics of America like to use to criticize the United States. So that's a, one of the major purposes that it seems to fulfill. Uh, and, and, and of course, that what you said is true. That's the dream of all the world, and um, we can look at the life of Pablo Neruda and his hope for Chile. Uh, for an example, uh, we featured on a podcast as well as Julia de Burgos, although very differently expressed. But uh, from a political standpoint, what Fitzgerald criticizes is less the idea itself, as I told you. He's a Thomas Jefferson fan as well. But he challenges this myth that there is a place on earth that is free from corruption innate in the human heart. Uh, that the United States is a, such a place and regardless of the systems of checks and balances uh, built into our system, it is an illusion to believe that those who make it to the top of the social, economic, and political worlds escape the damaging mercenary uh, temptations that are inherent in those positions. I think I could do it. You think? (laughs) I'm sure you're willing to give it a try. I am. Well, and whether they're born there or whether um, they build their wealth themselves, and as I see it, uh, we read this book, we see very clearly the the lines for everybody getting blurred between right and wrong and legitimate and illegitimate and reality versus illusion and um, ultimately good versus evil, if you want to see it in those terms. Well... That's true, and that's the philosophical side of it, but he does it so artfully. He uses colors and cars and geography and dresses and symbols of all sorts, and he throws it into the most glamorous setting of his day. You know, the original readers saw this book as being modeled after their own moment. I mean, it would be kind of like if you set a story and you included characters and you model them after people like Kanye West and Tom Brady and Beyonce and Bill de Blasio and the music would all be rap and the technology would include up-to-date things like TikTok and iPhones and Zoom. Really, honestly, if you want to compare the way his book situated in his moment, you have to think of... Scott Fitzgerald is kind of the Shonda Rhimes of his day. You know, he was the popular writer and they just didn't think of him as this serious commentary of politics and society. Well, I I find that very interesting because historically, I always used to like to refer to the idea of the arrogance of the present. Uh, You mentioned it more than once. I've mentioned it too many times. But it's not that. It's just that he wasn't taken as the serious person that we take him to be today. Right. Well, getting back to Shonda Rhimes for a moment, uh, uh, you know, she may be the most accomplished television producer and author of our day. I mean, she's the, the head writer and creator and executive producer of shows that everybody knows, Grey's Anatomy and uh, Private Practice and How to Get Away with Murder and Scandal. And she um, wrote Crossroads, the uh, debut film of Britney Spears. I don't Britney know if she's Spears. proud of that. Maybe not. <laughs> 
<laughs> but anyway, her most recent thing is Bridgerton. So. Oh, yeah, that's the hit. And that's how Fitzgerald was. I mean, between 1919 and 1934, he made $400,000, mostly from short stories. And you can think of it as today, like TV episodes, popular things. His work was fun, popular, glamorous. Very Shonda Rhimes. So when The Great Gatsby came out, it just wasn't what people were expecting from him. And the story kind of fell flat. I mean, when you read the the critics of the day, it makes me laugh. Here's one. Fitzgerald's latest dud. Ruth Hale of the Brooklyn Daily Eagle said, Find me one chemical trace of magic, life, irony, romance, or mysticism in all of the great Gatsby, and I will bind myself to read one Scott Fitzgerald book a week for the rest of my life. <laughs> of all the things she I missed, know, she I missed know. irony. <laughs> Oh, man, that sounds like some of those Edgar Allan Poe I reviews. Oh, and it does. And listen to this. The money speaks for itself. He only made $7,000 from two printings of the book combined. Ouch. And the whole time he knew, he knew it was a masterpiece, and he believed it to be so all the way till his death. He set out to write, and I'm going to use his own words here, something new. Something extraordinary and beautiful and simple and intricately patterned. And he did it. He did every bit of that. In fact, that was one of the things that the critics didn't like about it. They called it too geometric. (laughs) (laughs) What does that mean? How can you be too geometric? Well, I don't know, but I kind of think what I understand it to be is that it's just too tight. Like everything fits together a little bit too well. I read one theory that said he modeled the whole thing after a vaudeville show. Vaudeville shows normally have nine acts and he has nine chapters. And there are people who look at it that way. And you can see each, you know, chapter as an act themed after the corresponding act that it would have been in the vaudeville show. And it is kind of overblown in a vaudeville sort of way. Oh, of course. I mean, but do you think there's any validity to that? I mean, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with that term, uh, during the early part of the 20th century, America had these variety shows called vaudeville, and they were really popular. And they were basically uh, circus-like shows with crazy characters and lots of music. And uh, I guess in a way I can see it. We've seen crazy characters for sure, as well as lots of music in this book. Oh, for sure. I don't really know. I mean, it's popular, and uh, I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me. But the idea is everything is so deliberate. And if you buy into the vaudeville pattern, you know, chapters four and five, if they were acts four and five in a vaudeville show, act four would include absurd characters, and chapter four fits that bill. And act five in a vaudeville show is characterized by near misses, And that's exactly what we're going to see in chapter five of this book. But another remarkable thing about the structure that hits right here is that it's smack dab in the middle of the book where Daisy and Gatsby meet. And that is a thousand bajillion percent intentional. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I'm glad you picked a high number. All right. So uh, with that, are we ready to jump into chapters four and five? I think so. The beginning of the chapter really introduces a long cast of characters. In fact, the first two pages are nothing but names, and it's kind of interesting. We don't have time to really talk about that. The most interesting one, the one that reoccurs the most, is Clip Springer, who's considered the border because he stays at Gatsby's house for so long. Some would call that a mooch. (laughs) Yeah, and he's going to make an appearance in Chapter 5 for sure. Uh, But the really interesting characters are not the guests, or even the gangsters, although there's something to be said for meeting a man whose jewelry is made up of human mold. <laughs> Teeth, tooth jewelry. I know, but even that is not uh, going to displace the debutante that we are going to be talking about. <laughs> oh, well, no doubt. Uh, and I know we don't have time to get into the real colorful men of history who inspired these hilarious descriptions. 
But if anyone is interested, um, look into the life of uh, Herbert Bayard Swope, whose parties inspired Gatsby's parties, um, and the bootlegger Max Gerlach, who is the model for Gatsby, and George Remus, who Fitzgerald actually met in Louisville. So any Google search is just fun if you enjoy finding out those kind of things. Well, and it is crazy that the people that he modeled his stories after really did some of these insane things that appear kind of made up. And what do we say about authors writing out of their experience? That's what they do. It makes the best stories. Well, George Remus, you mentioned, uh, he met in Louisville, and that's where we want to start today. Because in Chapter 4, we take a time out from that current moment, and there's a flashback where we get to meet the original Daisy Faye before she gets married. Daisy Faye of Louisville, Kentucky, a place where you've actually visited many times. Yes, I have. It's a fine city. <laughs> because the College Board, for many years, sent AP readers to congregate there and grade hundreds of thousands, really, of essays from all around the world. Well, I mean, that's so true. And Louisville, Kentucky, um, the fictional hometown of Daisy Faye, is a southern city, and it's famous for Churchill Downs, the Kentucky Derby, and Kentucky Bourbon, and the Louisville basketball team. <laughs> uh, Louisville's charming. Um, it's historical. It's mythological. It's it's uh, and right in the middle of it is the Sealbach Hotel, and um, that's the hotel Tom Buchanan descended upon from Chicago with his entourage of a hundred people on the weekend of his wedding. And um, Fitzgerald, and, th and this is where you're going to see a lot of overlap between fiction and nonfiction. Um, like Gatsby was a soldier during World War I and stationed, albeit, you know, only for a month near Louisville. <laughs> he made the most of it. He did. On the weekends, um, he, like a lot of soldiers, would escape Camp Zachary Taylor. There's a fine presidential name. <laughs> Uh, in, in his impeccable uniform that he had Taylor made from Brooks Brothers, and I want to sidetrack and say that's not unusual. Teddy Roosevelt had all of his uh, military uniforms. So people uniforms. would custom make their own? If you were officers and of oh. certain. Yes, you could. Uh, anyway, um, uh, he enters into the Sealbach Hotel as the handsomest man in the room, and uh, he seeks to charm and seduce, as soldiers would do. And <laughs> Zelda, his wife, is not from Louisville. She's actually from Alabama uh, uh, in another city. So you can see how he plays around with his past. Yeah. But she, like Daisy, refuses to marry him because rich girls don't marry poor boys. <laughs> to quote Tom Buchanan. You probably heard that. Yeah. Well, Fitzgerald was stationed near Louisville in 1918, and Prohibition uh, didn't start till 1920. So he made good use of the opulent Sealbach Hotel Bar, uh, so much so that he was thrown out of the Sealbach Bar at least three times in the four weeks that he was there. <laughs> the man knows how to make an impression. Good mm. Lord. Well, in his sober state, Fitzgerald sets Jordan Baker's retailing of Daisy's past to be in October of 1917. So that would be like one year before he was there. But anyway, I want to point out a couple of things here which I find interesting and to think about. So far, we've talked about Fitzgerald's criticism of corruption and the American dream. We've talked about colors and irony and dust and existential atheism. A lot of that. <laughs> and all of this is in this book. But now I want to change directions and make it a little bit more historical, nostalgic, something besides or beyond politics, really. Because there is emotional content in this story that we can understand at a personal level. This bittersweet feeling of lost opportunity. Everyone is going to experience that if they're honest with themselves as they get older in some way or another. So this is going to set up the first four chapters, well, let me put it this way. The first four chapters, you see this excitement and happy nostalgia, so to speak. And it's going to peak in ch chapter five, which is the really famous one. Fitzgerald said that was his personal favorite, that he told uh, his editor that, and he rewrote it the most. And after chapter five, the book is going to take this marked the negative turn and it's going to have nostalgic emotions there too but you could almost describe it as a nostalgia hangover <laughs> that's a Fitzgerald metaphor threw in you know because of his right. issues <laughs> you don't want either one of those things <laughs> but it becomes extremely evident if it hasn't before that he's experimenting with chronology things are not gonna every chapter does not 
go in this chronological order. This chapter is very cinematic. It creates these montages of the past and the present, the New York bar, and then we're going to flip over to Louisville. I want to point out, because this I find very progressive of Fitzgerald, and it gives Daisy's story to a different narrator. Nick does not tell Daisy's story for her. Jordan does. So we have a female voice talking to us about what you could look at is the female doppelganger of Gatsby. Doppelganger. Doppelganger. <laughs> yes. I never heard that word until I watch Vampire Diaries, and they're full oh. of doppelgangers. I've been using the word ever since once I learned how yeah. to pronounce it. But anyway, can you read how Jordan first meets Gatsby? This is a really interesting passage. The largest of the banners and the largest of the lawns belonged to Daisy Fay's house. She was just 18, two years older than me, and by far the most popular of all the young girls in Louisville. She dressed in white and had a little white roadster, and all day long the telephone rang in her house and excited young officers from Camp Taylor demanded the privilege of monopolizing her that night. Anyways, for an hour. When I came opposite her house that morning, her white roadster was beside the curb, and she was sitting in it with a lieutenant I had never seen before. They were so engrossed in each other that she didn't see me until I was five feet away. Hello, Jordan, she called unexpectedly. Please come here. I was flattered that she wanted to speak to me because of all the other girls I admired her most. She asked me if I was going to the Red Cross and make bandages. I was. Well then, would I tell them that she couldn't come that day? The officer looked at Daisy while she was speaking in a way that every young girl wants to be looked at sometime. And because it seemed romantic to me, I remember the incident ever since. His name was Jay Gatsby, and I didn't lay eyes on him again for over four years. Even after I'd met him on Long Island, I didn't realize it was the same man. <laughs> well, it's so easy to reduce Daisy to this materialistic skank that stays with this awful man just because he has money. You know, Nick kind of looks at her like, that for sure. But by the end of the book, I want to suggest Fitzgerald is going to do something much more interesting than that. She has a white childhood. Notice the color. But like I said, she's the doppelganger. I want to point out something many people have observed. Neither Daisy nor Gatsby ever get a physical description in this book, Gatsby can be described, and he's often described by his dress, but Daisy is really pretty much described by her voice. Everything else you have to make up in your imagination. These two aren't real. They're dreams. But while Gatsby goes away and keeps this dream of Daisy alive for five years, building her up, Daisy's dream of Gatsby dies much earlier. Notice that as she sits in that car, Jordan remembers it's because of the way Gatsby looks at her in a way that every girl wants to be looked at at some time. What's more dreamy than that? (laughs) (laughs) But look at the next paragraph. Not one paragraph later, Daisy's dream is over. Read that one for us. Wild rumors were circulating about her, how her mother had found her packing her bag one winter night to go to New York and say goodbye to a soldier who was going overseas. She was effectually prevented, but she wasn't on speaking terms with her family for several weeks. After that, she didn't play around with soldiers anymore, but only with a few flat-footed, short-sighted young men in town who couldn't get into the army at all. By the next autumn, she was gay again, as gay as ever. She had a debut after the armistice, and in February, she was presumably engaged to a man from New Orleans. In June, she married Tom Buchanan at Chicago with more pomp and circumstance than Louisville ever knew before. He came down with a 100 people in four private cars and hired a whole floor of the Seelbach Hotel, and the day before the wedding, he gave her a string of pearls valued at $350,000. And... By the way, I looked that up, how much that would be in today's terms. That, how much? That comes out to about $4 million. Oh, my. That's a nice wedding gift. Don't, don't expect anything <laughs> like that. Oh, well, 
The next part is what I want to highlight. Let me read what Jordan says. I was a bridesmaid. I came into her room half an hour before the bridal dinner and found her lying on her bed as lovely as the June night in a flowered dress and as drunk as a monkey. She had a bottle of Sartern in one hand and a letter in the other. Gradulate me, she muttered. Never had a drink before. I should use my Daisy voice. But oh, how I do love it. What's the matter, Daisy? I was scared. I can tell. I'd never seen a girl like that before. Here's dearsies. She groped around in a wastebasket she had with her on the bed and pulled out the string of pearls. Take them downstairs. Give them back to whoever they belong to. Tell them Daisy's changed her mind. Say Daisy's changed her mind. She began to cry. She cried and cried. I rushed out and found her mother's maid and we locked the door and got her back into a cold bath. She wouldn't let go of the letter. She took it into the tub with her and squeezed it up with a wet ball and only let it leave me in the soap dish when she saw that it was coming to pieces like snow. But she didn't say another word. She gave her spirits of ammonia and put ice on her forehead and hooked her back into her dress. And half an hour later, when we walked out of the room, the pearls were around her neck and the incident was over. Next, at five o'clock, she married Tom Buchanan without so much as a shiver and started off on a three-month trip to South Beach. I saw them in Santa Barbara when they came back, and I thought I'd never seen a girl so mad about her husband. If he left the room for a minute, she'd look around uneasily and say, Where's Tom? Gone? Well, let me skip over because there's a lot of the stuff there, but I want to get to the part. There's st- this is Jordan still talking about Daisy looking for Tom, and she says this. She spent hours rubbing fingers over his eyes. And After I left Santa Barbara, Tom ran into a wagon on the Ventura Road one night and ripped a front wheel off his car. The girl who was with him got into the papers, too, because her arm was broken. She was one of the chambermaids in the Santa Barbara Hotel. Wow. Well, you know, there are eyes and cars and a lot of stuff we've talked about before up to this <laughs> Symbols point. Symbols everywhere. Yes. White. True. But there's another really important thing that we haven't talked about that I want to bring up now, and that's water. Water always plays a huge role in stories, and it definitely does in this book. It's Between the Eggs. In chapter five, we're going to talk about the rain. But what does it mean normally? Well, water is the most primal of archetypes. It's important even in religion, in every religion. It's a sign of rebirth. It's renewal, and it's what's going on here. Daisy is getting baptized the night before her wedding. She went under that icy water, and she let her letter from Gatsby disintegrate like snow. The the innocence is going to melt away, and she's going to come up the ice princess. A woman so devout of feeling that she can exist in a world that she knows she's nothing but an ornament, a statue, a collector's item, Daisy, the golden girl. Gatsby founded his vision on Daisy Fay, the fairy, the girl he described as gleaming like silver safe and proud above the hot struggles of the poor. We're going to see in chapter 5 that he literally glows in her presence. But that girl came down to reality well before Gatsby ever does. You're going to see next week that Gatsby actually has two baptisms in this book. One, when he becomes Gatsby, and the other one is in his backyard swimming pool Hmm, at the end. Yikes. (laughs) Uh, Well, after... A little uh, foreshadowing. Yes, a little foreshadowing (laughs) and... um, after Fitzgerald destroys Daisy's dream, uh, he goes after Gatsby. At the end of the chapter, end of chapter four, Fitzgerald uh, gives the narrator role back to Nick, and uh, Jordan finishes her story by talking about how Gatsby's house is across the water from Daisy's house. Uh, but it wasn't a coincidence at all. And why not? Uh, Gatsby bought that house so that Daisy would be just across the bay. Uh, Then it had not been merely the stars to which he had aspired on that June night. 
He came alive to me, delivered suddenly from the womb of purposelessness splendor. He wants to know, continued Jordan, if you'll invite Daisy to your house some afternoon and then let him come over. The modesty of the demand shook me. He had waited five years and bought a mansion where he dispensed starlight to casual moths so that he could come over some afternoon to a stranger's garden. Jordan ends her chat with Nick telling him he's supposed to set it up, but Daisy isn't supposed to know about it. Then Nick and Jordan make out in a car, (laughs) quite possibly the most uh, unromantic love scene ever. Well, let me read this quote that kind of summarizes that. Unlike Gatsby and Tom Buchanan, um, I had no girl whose disembodied face floated along the dark cornices and blinding signs. And so I drew up the girl beside me, tightening my arms. Her wan, scornful mouth smiled. And so I drew her up closer again, this time to my face. It's just so horrible. Isn't there a cliche, if you can't be with the one you love, love the one you're with, or some horrible thing like that? (laughs) Actually a song. Uh, But this is even worse than that. If you can't find someone to love, be with a disembodied face. (laughs) So true. You know, there's a lot of poetry, the way he talked about the moths dispensing starlight and it's stranger's garden. And that's so romantic. And then you get to... Nick with the disembodied (laughs) face. Mm. (laughs) Chapter five, though, is the big meeting, the middle of the chapter. The chapter Fitzgerald told Max Perkins he loved the most. That's the editor guy. His favorite chapter. It was. Well, it's also where, from my perspective, uh, this is where we see a lot of the mythical qualities uh, stand out, which makes me think Greek... (laughs) Uh, Empedocles, the great philosopher, came up with the famous four-part theory of saying everything comes from air, water, earth, and fire. And and as we see Fitzgerald play around with all traditional colors, I can't help but see him play around with the uh, traditional basic elements that the ancients thought created the entire world. Well, I think it does feel very, you know, mythic like that. That's a great point, you know. They're everywhere. And if you pay attention, you notice them more. I mean, Daisy doesn't walk. She floats around. You know, that's air. The Valley of Ashes, Earth. Manhattan is hot, fire. And then all the water. So, yeah, I mean, you could say you're, you're, oh, you're just looking for stuff, but you're not. Fitzgerald does everything very, very deliberately, and you see it. That's why they called it, you know, geometric. You kind of see it. Uh, in these most important parts of the story. For example, Exhibit A, Chapter 5. Gatsby tries, unsuccessfully, by the way, which I wish we had time to read this, to recruit Nick to work for the mob. And it's a really funny, understated, you know, this is funny. He can just, he's funny kind of exchange, but we don't have time to go there. So after that, we arrive at the famous moment where Gatsby and Daisy meet. And yes, It is pouring rain, potential for rebirth, regeneration. That's what he wants. It's also blistering hot. There are references to pink clouds, remember? Mm -hmm. White and innocent and passion and love. Pink clouds after Daisy visits the mansion. It's all there. All the elements of primeval earth coming together to create something or recreate something, the world as Gatsby wants to create it. Except we know it's an illusion. It's fake. But let's walk it back and go through the scene with the archetypes in our minds so we see them with the colors and the Greek elements. But remember, those are just supporting details. The real focus of this chapter is on Gatsby's absolute determination to walk back time. Matthew Bercoli, he was the premier American expert on F. Scott Fitzgerald until he died in 2008. And the reason I know him is because he wrote the preface, which we use in school in this authorized version of the book. It's the one that has the blue cover uh, with the eyes in the middle, and there's red lipstick and fire at the bottom. Anyway, you've probably seen the cover. We may could put a picture of it on the website. But in his preface, he mentions, because people do this stuff, you've seen us talk about it before, that 
Fitzgerald references time 450 times, it's like four times a page. 87 direct references to the word itself, but that's not even counting the constant use of time symbolism. That is really what I want us to focus on for the rest of this discussion, because at the end of the day, what Gatsby wants to do is stop time. He wants to walk back time. When he walks in with his white suit and gold tie, he wants to recreate that moment that Jordan told us about when he met Daisy those five years ago. Except this time, he's a version of himself that could beat Tom in the competition or whatever he has in his mind as being the competition. And Daisy, with her clear artificial note, says... I'm certainly awfully glad to see you again. And what does he do when she says this? He leans his head so far back that it rests against the face of a defunct, that means it doesn't work, mantelpiece clock. And as Gadsby talks, the clock tilts dangerously at the pressure of his head, and he has to turn and catch it before it crashes and breaks. When Gadsby says, I'm sorry about the clock, I told you... Chapter 5 was about near misses, by the way. He is sorry about the clock, but not really about the clock. He's sorry about the lost time, the lost five years. I want to make one comment on your Daisy accent. (laughs) We're in Memphis, which is farther south Uh, than Louisville, (laughs) but yet you're using an accent that's farther south of Memphis. (laughs) I know, but it's good. I like it. Uh, Okay. (laughs) Um, you know, for Gatsby, um, his body is in the present, but his mind is five years in the past. And I, I don't really want to get Freudian. Oh, or may, maybe I really do. Yes, you do. Uh, but this does remind me of a, of a quote from Freud when he says, um, We call a belief an illusion when a wish fulfillment is a prominent factor in its motivation. Pretty Yikes. appropriate. It really is. Well, for Gatsby, time is something money can buy. It's something you can create. It's a commodity. It's like everything else for sale in the world. If you're rich enough, you can buy it. Even time, even Daisy. Uh, The scene where Gatsby takes Daisy over to his house uh, in the movie version with Leonardo DiCaprio (laughs) is so memorable. And uh, now that you mention colors, I tend to notice them. And there is a a gold odor. Exactly. Things that can't be real. He throws colors in. And and a lot of purple, which is made from blue and red. And this scene is is about the illusion of love. You're tracking with Fitzgerald, baby. (laughs) I'm trying. <laughs> Here's a good line. They're in Gatsby's bedroom, and he's evaluating everything in his house according to the measure of Daisy's response to it. Then he says this. Well, actually, he the text says this. After his embarrassment and his unreasoning joy, he was consumed with wonder at her presence. He had been full of the idea so long, dreamed it right through to the end, waited with his teeth set, so to speak, at an inconceivable pitch of intensity. Now in the reaction, he was running down like an overwound clock. Mm. Now, is that not poetry? That is very poetic. (laughs) Well, to me, the the funniest scene um, is the one with the shirts. Oh, I know. It is funny, and we need to keep reading because we're getting to it. Recovering himself in a minute... He opened for us two hulking patent cabinets, which helped his mast suits and dressing gowns and ties, and his shirts piled like bricks and stacks a dozen high. And he says, I've got a man in England who buys me clothes. He sends over a selection of things at the beginning of each season, spring and fall. He took out a pile of shirts and began throwing them one by one before us, Shirts of sheer linen and thick silk and fine flannel, which lost their folds as they fell and covered the table in many-colored disarray. While we admired, he brought more, and the soft, rich heat mounted higher. Shirts with stripes and scrolls and plaids and coral and apple green and lavender and faint orange with monograms of Indian blue. Suddenly, with a strange sound, Daisy bent her head into the shirts and began to cry stormily. They're such beautiful 
Shirts, she sobbed, her voice muffled in a thick fold. It makes me sad because I've never seen such, such beautiful shirts before. <laughs> Once again. Why do you think she cries? It's just strange. I mean, she's rich. Well, uh, you know, I'm the weak link here on the symbolism, but I'll, <laughs> I'll take a stab at it. I mean, of course, I don't know. Um, but it could be a couple of things. Like uh, you mentioned about Daisy, um, the, the ice queen from the previous chapter. Uh, Daisy may be understanding what Gatsby doesn't, um, that this is an illusion and that their relationship um, isn't real. Uh, it could be that Daisy is regretting marrying Tom and thinking about having a life with Gatsby. But honestly, when when I put on the historical lens, oh yes, uh, I remember that this is the 1920s, and it destroyed for so many uh, the values on which they had created their whole culture and their identity. And if I look at this book uh, the way you've been wanting us to look at it, you know, full of symbolism and. Uh, mythology and meaning, uh, I land on the idea that for many people up to that point and even today, uh, we believe that love and materialism are not connected. And uh, people won't love you because of your money, not really. And, and you can have love even if you don't have money. I mean, we can subscribe to these ideas, but what we see in Daisy is someone who, in her own words, is cynical. And that's the first thing she ever told us about herself. And uh, this is the woman who literally wants her daughter to be a beautiful fool. And here she is crying. I find it so interesting. And because in general, cynical people don't cry. Uh, so why is she crying? I mean, uh, one idea is because Daisy, like a, a lot of her generation, finds the shirts and materialism they represent uh, the substitute for the uh, innocent, fulfilling love of her white past. I mean, uh, the one she doesn't believe in anymore and the one that doesn't exist. It's, it's a beautiful moment that she shares with Gatsby, but she believes the shirts are a safe, real thing in a room, and I guess that would make me cry, too. Well, it's pitiful, for sure. and It's certainly possible that this encounter with the real Daisy instead of the one Gatsby had made up in his head could be having a similar effect on Gatsby. He says this, If it wasn't for the mist, we could see your home across the bay. You always have a green light that burns all night at the end of your dock. Remember, green is the color of growth, but it's also the color of money. But anyway, Daisy puts her arm through his abruptly, but he seemed absorbed in what he had just said. Possibly it had occurred to him that the colossal significance of that light had now vanished forever. Compared to the great distance that had separated him from Daisy, it had seemed very near to her, almost touching her. It had seemed as close as a star to the moon. Now it was again a green light on a dock. His count of enchanted objects had diminished by one. Daisy calls them to the window just a little while later, and we see that the rain is still falling. But the darkness had parted in the west, and there was a pink and golden billow of foamy clouds above the sea. Look at that, she whispered, and then after a moment, I'd like to just get one of those pink clouds and put you in it and push you around. <laughs> Wow, that, that seems such a stellar reaction to the <laughs> to the depth of what Gatsby's <laughs> uncovering. And um, well, this chapter, which at face value is uh, really absolutely as romantic as this book will ever get, it, it ends with the cynicism and it's such irony. It, it's very much the nihilism and the postmodernism so often seen in the 1920s. And um, Clip Singer is playing two songs that were super popular in the 1920s, and you can listen to them on YouTube. You can find them. Uh, the Love Nest was a very popular song about a house, and it literally says that the Love Nest is a small house on a farm, but filled with warmth and love inside, and it's better than a palace with a gilded dome. Yikes. There's the gilded thing. So they're in the gilded. They're not in the Love Nest, they even are. though that's what Clip Singer is playing. The second song, um, the one actually quoted in the text, is from a song called Ain't We Got Fun, and uh, the lines in the book read this. One thing's sure, and nothing sure, the rich get richer, and the poor get children. <laughs> oh, no. Well, both Daisy 
and Gatsby pursued love in their youth, but they aren't those people anymore. Daisy, I like to call her the ice queen, and Gatsby created his own Daisy, something he can literally purchase, and that's not really love either. I mean, Fitzgerald's sarcasm is in that song choice. The chapter ends like this. As I went over to say goodbye, now this is Nick talking, I saw that the expression of bewilderment had come back into Gatsby's face, as though a faint doubt had occurred to him as to the quality of his present happiness. Almost five years. There must have been moments, even that afternoon, when Daisy tumbled short of his dreams, not through her own fault, but because of the colossal vitality of his illusions. It had gone beyond her, beyond everything. He had thrown himself into it with a creative passion, adding to it all the time, decking it out with every bright feather that drifted his way. No amount of fire or freshness can challenge what a man will store up in his ghostly heart. As I watched him, he adjusted himself a little, visibly. His hand took hers, and as she said something low in his ear, he turned toward her with a rush of emotion. I think that voice helps him most with its fluctuating, feverish warmth, because it couldn't be overdreamed. That voice was a deathless song. And then, of course, Nick leaves them to go home walking in the rain. Well, what do you think? I mean, it's it's not really a Jane Austen (laughs) feeling there at the end of that chapter. It's the anti-Jane Austen. (laughs) I mean, it's about as far afield as you can go uh, if you're going to start addressing love stories and things like that. But it feels like a love story, but then it isn't. Right, and, uh, and it, uh, Gatsby is so masterfully displayed or explained in his disillusionment and how he had created this idol and the idol could never live up to the, uh, to the, to the idea. Well, there you go. Well, thanks for being with us today. I um, hope you enjoyed this episode of The Great Gatsby. Uh, check us out on our social media. Check us out on our website, howtolovelitpodcast.com. Drop us a line. Get in contact with us. We'll see you next time. Peace out. Mm-hmm.